This is Join Us in France, episode 443. 443. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and Join Us in France is the podcast where we talk about France. Everyday life in France, great places to visit in France, French culture, history, gastronomy, and news related to travel to France. Today, I bring you a conversation with Elise Riven of Toulouse Guided Walks about the history of aviation in France and in Toulouse in particular, since that's where we both live, and much of the history of aviation in France has taken place in Toulouse. When you listen to this episode, I'll barely be done with the France boot camp, and one of the things participants wanted to do was to visit Airbus and Aeroscopia, the museum dedicated to the history of Airbus. So it's all fresh in my mind. There will be no magazine part of the podcast today and no new patrons to thank, but I do want to mention that this podcast is supported by donors and listeners who buy my tours and services, including my itinerary consult service and my GPS self-guided tours of Paris on the Voice Map app. And you can browse all of that at my boutique, joinusinfrance.com forward slash boutique. Back with you next Sunday with more and also a great episode with Phil Robertson about visiting Normandy during a D-Day anniversary. That was fun to record, and I think you'll love listening to it as well. And remember, please send me voice feedback using the voice memo on your phone. Email that feedback to annie at joinusinfrance.com. Merci. Bonjour Elise. Bonjour Annie. Oh, we have an exciting topic today. We're going to talk about aviation in Toulouse. Aviation and Toulouse. Today we're talking about Toulouse and the world of aviation, which it's huge here. It's like, I swear to God, half of the people in my area work for Airbus or an Airbus contractor. Absolutely. I really wanted to check and make sure that this was one of those things I was going to say that was correct. It is the largest employer of Toulouse and the region which includes, of course, all its subsidiaries and subcontractors, but it employs almost 40,000 people. Right. It's huge around here. All right. Well, you have prepared a lot of aviation things for us to consider, and I'll jump in every now and then, but I'll let you take it away, Liz. Well, I think most people know that Toulouse is the home of Airbus. That's our big company that produces airplanes here in not only France, but it's actually a conglomerate. So there's a joint effort with Spain and Germany and England. But it is our Boeing. How's that? You know, it's like it's the big company. It's the big company that produces all the commercial and some military planes. Right. And it's headquartered in Toulouse. It's headquarters in Toulouse. This is where the largest assembly line and assembly hangars are. Some of the parts are actually manufactured elsewhere. But the fact is that Toulouse is where aviation in France was born and where it has continued for now about 130 years. Right. And when I was young, that's when they had the Caravelle and the Concorde and all that. I grew up in Toulouse and of course you bathed in it. Even if you weren't, my dad didn't work for Airbus, but he worked at some of the facilities because he was an electrician who specialized in installing big machines. And so he was at lots of Airbus facilities over the years. It's very interesting because doing the research on this for the history of it, I knew that it had started in the region of or in and around Toulouse and that it is really the home of aviation, but it had its ups and downs. But right now, for instance, for visitors who come to Toulouse, there are several places that are fascinating to visit and they are really worth it because they give you an overview of the whole history of aviation. And of course, you can go and visit Airbus Industry, which is a place where you do have to reserve ahead of time because they're very strict about the identity control. They're always worried about the industrial espionage and things like that. But you can visit the assembly hangars. You can actually see the people working on putting pieces of the plane together. Right. And I should say that even as a subcontractor of Airbus, which I've been at different times of my life, you do need a lot of 
clearance to enter the facility. Okay, Getting a badge is even a visitor badge takes some effort. It takes some effort. But it is fascinating if you want to actually see that. Next to it is this new museum that opened just a number of years ago. I don't even remember how long ago, but not that long ago, called Aeroscopia. And it is wonderful because even for somebody like me who has flown a lot but now gets very nervous in an airplane, it's really fun. You see an example of every kind of plane just about from the beginning right up to the last 380, which now no longer flies. No, it flies. It is not being produced, but it flies. Oh, okay. That's right. It still flies in Asia, I believe. It flies anywhere they have bought it. It's just that they don't produce it anymore, but they still service it. It's in operation. It's yeah. a beauty anyway. It's just a beauty. And my pride and joy is a photo of me in front of the controls of a Concorde. <laughs> That's the closest I'll ever get to flying in a supersonic plane, let me tell you. you know, It's really neat. It's a very, very interesting and well-documented museum. And it's great for young people. It's great for adults. And you can go in and out of almost all of these planes, which is kind of fun to do. There's also a small aeronautic museum that just opened up at Montaudran. Uh, Montaudran. Yes. I don't know why. It always sticks in my mouth. That. And that's because that was the very first airfield here in Toulouse at the very beginning of the 20th century. And my dad worked like a stone's throw away from the airfield. And that was where he worked as an electrician. Yeah. When he put together, so when you're an industrial electrician, you put together all the inputs and outputs in a big old box. And he worked on these. And then he went and took that box and installed it at the factory. And so he did all the prep work at Montaudran. That's yeah. really cool. That really is. And now we also have a museum that has a lot of interactive stuff, which is really good if you're doing a visit with your family or if you're interested in space. And that's called the Cité de l'Espace. Because on top of the history of aviation, thanks to the history of aviation being in Toulouse, from there it grew to be also the center of all of the aerospace research and industry. So there are uh, several different places that are really good to visit. And uh, they give you a real overview of all of the things happening in France since the beginning of the 20th century, basically. Yes, Cité de l'Espace is very cool. I haven't been in many years, but there's a lot of stuff you can see. So when they decommission stuff, they put it at the Cité de l'Espace and you can walk through it. They have a lot of exciting stuff there, and I need to go back. You uh, can actually sit inside a satellite in a space capsule. And uh, let me tell you, all I needed was two minutes inside it to know that would not have been for me. I probably wouldn't even fit in there, would I? Oh, yeah. You would just have to pull your knees up a little bit, I think. But it's fascinating. It really is. So there is a lot in and around Toulouse that is inspired by or based on the history, of course, of aviation. We even have a hotel right in the center of the city, the Hotel des Grands Balcons, which was the pension, which is kind of like a rooming house for the first experimental pilots at the beginning of the 20th century. So there are little tidbits everywhere that give us an idea that this is the home of aviation. So, of course, we all know that since the beginning of time, humans have been fascinated by flying, by birds. It turns out even before people like Leonardo da Vinci, I found out by reading one of these texts online in the 800s under the Andalusia, when that was the, I don't know if you call it a kingdom or whatever you want to call it, that was in most of Spain. There was a man who obviously at the time was the scientific mind of the era who put on wings made of feathers and jumped off a hill. <laughs> I mean, no, and he sorry. apparently lived to tell about it, you know? Okay, so you're more the scientific one than I am, but the reality is, and it is interesting to have really done this reading, is that until really the middle of the 19th century, when there was a fascination with the idea of flying, but mostly it was done with the concept of hot air and balloons and things like that. The thinking was not in terms of a mechanical way of moving an object that was heavier than air into air, into the space. Right, right. So. I mean, if you observe birds, they fly, and it seems like a miracle that they fly, right? But if you try to 
put wings on a human and <laughs> flap our wings. It does not work. Well, I think you get tired very quickly. It's just flapping a lot, you know. Well, we're way too heavy. I mean, birds have hollow bones and it's just funny to see the, to think of all the people over the centuries that must have tried this. It's just insane. But in France, we had a lot of pioneers of aviation in a way, but they were doing lighter than air flight, which means hot air balloons. We were fresh out of the gate with the hot air balloons, had a bunch of them. Um, French filled with hot air, don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think there's some to that. <laughs> but yeah, so lots of hot air balloons in Paris. Even in the Tuileries Gardens, did you know that they set up hot air balloons and you could pay some money and go up in the balloon? Was this in the 1800s? Yes, yes. Well, would you go up in a hot air balloon? No. That was a very clear and definite answer. It's like, Hell no. No, hell no. No, 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 no. Would you have gone in a blimp? Probably not. Probably. No, I know my limits. <laughs> and definitely that's my limit. I'm not. Je suis pas téméraire. How would you say that? No, not courageous, really? I'm not brave for that no, kind of thing. No, I am not no, brave. No. So you wouldn't do a Delta plane? Oh, no, 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 no. Well, I'm asking you, but I would never do any of those things either. So there you are. I wouldn't do a zip line. No, 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 no. I think it's actually a, an amazing miracle of human ingenuity that planes exist and they actually fly and they get these heavy things off the ground. And they go across the oceans. I really do think that, you know. So that's the funny bit is I am not at all afraid in planes mm. at all. Not a bit. But they have to be big enough planes. <laughs> yeah. For me, size matters when it comes to planes and boats and things. I do not like being on a tiny boat. Uh-huh. But I don't mind at all a huge cruise ship. Same with airplanes. The bigger the plane, the easier it is for me to get on there. Well, you know, it is a fact. I mean, I have... Two or three times in my life flown in a two-seater, twice here in France and once in the United States. I have to say, that I have to tell, this is the truth. Once I took a, a half of a tranquilizer before I went up in the air, but I had such a great time because I wasn't scared because I had taken half the tranquilizer. And it was really pretty to look down and see the fields and everything. But it is a fact that the larger the plane the less you feel it, which is the irony of it. You know, when you're inside it, you don't feel it as much in the big... I've flown the 747s a lot. I have flown the 380 several times, and they are wonderful because you feel it much less than in a smaller plane, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But still, if I think about how heavy it is and what will happen if it has to go plop, then it gets me a little bit nervous. We're making everybody nervous now. <laughs> They're never flying to a ransom again. No, but I have to say, this is just, I don't know if people know this out there. One day a week for a number of years, I've been teaching a group of students in the Aeronautic University here in Toulouse. It's just a basic English class. But I tell them about my fears of all this stuff, and they just give me such reassurance. They give me all the reasons, the aerodynamic reasons why I shouldn't be worried about any of this at all, you know. So there you are. Planes work very, very, very well. They do work very well. So let's come back to Toulouse and the aeronautics. So, of course, in Germany and in England and in the United States by the 19th century, there really were lots of people who were experimenting and really obsessed with the idea of making humans fly, of the idea of how can we use the air to get from one place to another, really the idea of transportation. And of course, most of it was done with the idea of hot air and balloons and the equivalent, which was a blimp a little bit later. And there were still people who were obstinate and really trying to make these enormous wings and fly. And most of them made little bleepy leaps, like a jump on the ground, you know. <laughs> these leaves, they would measure, some of them, they would measure how many feet between when they tried to flap their wings and when they actually landed on the ground. But believe it or not, it was actually, there was a man named Clément Adair who came from Muret, which is a town just south of the center of Toulouse. And he trained as an engineer. He was born in 1841. And he was fascinated by the idea of invention. He was really an inventor. He was one of the first people to make what would I guess be called like ball bearings and things like that. So he really had the mechanical engineer spirit in every sense of the word. And along with his work, it became his obsession to figure out how to make a flying machine. And he was one of the first, as you get towards the end of the 19th century, 
who really, I guess, maybe by experimentation, I really don't know, I came to understand that what was needed was to create basically a mechanical machine that would lift something that was not just hot air. Then, you know, so we're talking really about machines with propellers and some kind of engineering right. thing. Talking heavier than air. Heavier than air, right. So he created these things. There are a couple of pictures you can see online. A couple looked like enormous bats. The wings were made out of cloth, which they were still at the beginning of World War I, but these enormous wings that really look like a huge bat. But he's the one that invented the word in French, avion, which is what we call an airplane. Yeah. And it comes from the Latin word for bird. And his first prototype he called Aeole, uh, E-O-L-E, which he named after the Greek god of wind, which is very poetic, I think. Right. And in French, Aeolienne is a windmill. We still use that Greek god image. Right. And so apparently, many, many attempts and building and then failing. It was in 1890 that he actually was able to get something off the ground. And now, how long it lasted? But just the machine, not himself. Not himself, the machine. Probably it was a minute. It may have been two minutes. We're talking seconds here. We're talking seconds oh, here. Yes. You don't get very far that way. No, no yeah, you, you don't. Not. But it really confirmed and convinced him that this was the future, that if there was ever going to be a way of using the air to get from one place to the other, it was with something mechanical, basically. Right, mechanical fixed wing. And... Interestingly enough, he had made a fortune because he was such a good inventor. He invented all kinds of little devices. He was actually fascinated also by sound. And he was the first person to invent the Delta plane on top of everything else. So he was really obsessed with all of these things about some kind of traveling in the air. And he became known as the predecessor, I guess, of what came to be the very, very first airplane construction in. France, because we, of course, also by the end of the 19th century, have a few people in England and the famous Wright brothers in the United States. So it's very interesting because he is really given credit with being the first person to understand the mechanics that would be required to move something heavier than air into space. And it's a huge advance because if all you keep trying is flapping wings, you're never going to get there unless you're a bird. Unless you're a bird. Yes. Even today, we don't have, I mean, like, even a helicopter, it's a fixed wing. It's a fixed propeller. It's fixed around an axle. If all the parts move, it's too complicated to get lift. Although you know? I have to say, I understand the lift more in a plane than I do in a helicopter, but that's for a class in physics, which I've never taken in my life. So there you are. Yeah. Well, just to give the very basic what makes an airplane go is the airfoil shape. You need a curved shape. It looks like a teardrop, but just very elongated teardrop. And when you push that shape forward with propellers or jet engines or anything, you create lift because the air pressure is different on top of the wing than on the bottom of the wing. And that's what creates lift. That creates lift. Now, in modern airplanes, you can modify how much lift you get by moving the parts of the wing. So wings are not completely fixed. Right. There are slight flaps. You can right. see there them. There are flaps and there are slats and there's ailerons and there's all sorts of things that move. And they make slight differences in the lift that you get, okay? But even the Wright brothers, the reason why their airplane took off, so Wright brothers is two parallel wings right. that weren't quite flat, and that's why it worked. And then the brothers would lie flat on top of the upper wing, and they had propellers well, their wings were tiny. Both of them were tiny, had a little bit of a bend to it. And that's what created the lift. If you don't have any bend, you don't get lift. Okay. That's how it works. But I'm not a physicist. I just know that that's how it works. Yeah. Okay. So the next man, who is someone extremely important, who really is the person responsible for making the industry of aviation so important, particularly in and around Toulouse, is a man named Pierre-Georges Latécoère. 
And the yes. latte cuer industry actually still exists to this day. Definitely. They just built a brand new building like at La Roseray. It's very nice. It's very. Nice. It used to be really ugly, and they built a nice, shiny new building. It's very nice. Very, very nice. So Latakoea was actually born in Banyaris de Bigorre, which is actually in the foothills of the Pyrenees. And he was apparently a brilliant student. But ironically, he actually studied law at first, but his family owned a company. He was born in 1883. So he's really the generation that comes way after Adair. By the time he was grown... The Wright brothers had happened. They had, they had happened. Because that was 1903. Oh, three. Exactly. For and 12 seconds at 12 and 120 seconds. feet. Right, right. Which is amazing. At the time, it was amazing. But anyway, but, so by the time Latico was born, he could read in books and in the papers, you know, about all of this. Yes, this feat of, you know, I mean, this is amazing. People could finally fly. That's incredible. It's interesting because it doesn't look like at first he was more astute and visionary. But I don't know. He wasn't like Adair. He wasn't someone who was obsessed with figuring out the actual technical aspects of flying. So this is what makes it so interesting. The family factory was both a lumber factory and a mechanics factory. But he had no background as a scientist. He had no background as an engineer. But what happened was eventually... He took over the factory, he took over the company from his parents, and he moved part of it to Toulouse. And when he did, they started making wheels and mobile parts for tramways and train companies. And so how old was he when World War I broke out? He was in his late 30s. And when World War I broke out, his factory started supplying artillery and various pieces for the different kinds of weapons to the French army for the war. And so his connection to all of this is actually through the military and it's through the experience of war. And as the work became more and more sophisticated and they started using airplanes actually in World War I, about 1916, before that they hadn't even tried. And the first planes, if you see anything, it looks exactly like what the Wright brothers flew. I mean, it wasn't much more sophisticated than that. It was two double cloth wings and things like that. Oh, there's one. It looks like cardboards stuck together, like big old cardboard boxes. I don't know how it flew, but it did. What's amazing is that this is what they actually used. And the fact is that at the time, by 1916, it was the Germans who were much more advanced in the idea of using aviation as a weapon during the war. And they had developed, granted these very simple, primitive, what we would now call primitive planes, but they were starting to use it. And so Latakoea decided to use his company to build simple planes that would be used in combat against the Germans. And that is really how Latakoea became associated with uh, aviation. And his factories here in Toulouse were supplying these new aircraft for the war effort. It's really interesting to me how war always advances science and engineering. And that's mostly because, I mean, even in the times of Leonardo da Vinci, a lot of the people who were his patrons gave him money because he helped them think about weapons of war and think defensive things and whatever. And that's why they were willing to fund him. And to this day, it's still the same. If you go to a government and you say, okay, I think I can build you a thing that's going to help the army do this and such. It's easier to sell than if there's no defensive idea behind it. There's a lot of great ideas in the world that never get funded. And not only that, but very often when it's connected, unfortunately, to war, there's an urgency. So they put a lot more effort into it because it's needed right away. So it's, you know, look at antibiotics. And I mean, Velcro, my goodness, was discovered because they needed something like that for World War II. So you're absolutely right. What makes this interesting is that the Latakoea factory then started building these very simple craft and Toulouse, because it was so far from the front, was considered to be a very safe place. And at the time, you know, you've seen the changes in the last, what, since you were born here, I mean, in Toulouse. But imagine 120 something years ago, uh, Toulouse was much smaller and there was huge numbers of open fields. And so they could do all this testing of the planes. And for those two reasons, they had no interest in moving any of the aviation industry to any place else. And a lot of this was taking place in the area in the part of Toulouse that we now call Jolimont because it was a hilly area and it was completely like it was just dirt, dirt fields. 
you know, and they set up a lot of these companies. And that's where I grew up. That's where she grew up. She grew up actually inside an airplane. She never wants to tell (laughs) anybody that. But she actually was born inside an airplane there. And then, so this is what makes it interesting. There are still members of the Latakoa family. I mean, there are descendants of the original uh, owner and conceiver of all this. But he was really a visionary because as soon as World War I ended, he decided and realized, actually, that there would soon be a need for commercial aviation. And so he devoted the rest of his industry, his company, and his career to launching what became the first company that was called LAL, which was Latico Air Aviation. And in 1919, began the very first flights that actually flew from Toulouse to Barcelona. We're already going from one country to another and over the Pyrenees. So he knew... As you say, invention started by war, but continuing in civil society. And so there was an engineer that actually had started working for him named Duvoitine, who left him and created his own company in 1920. And he decided that since Latakoya was doing basically civil aviation, he was going to start specializing in aviation for military purposes. And he is the very first one, and his company was the first one, to design basically fighter planes. Oh, wow. Interesting. Interesting, right? I never heard of him. Yeah. Well, he sold his company in the 1930s. In about 1937, he sold his company. And part of what was left of his company wound up being given over to what became the aeronautic conglomerate later on. I mean, basically, during the Great Depression, something happened. And of course, it was a time when there wasn't, again, unfortunately, yet the World War II. And for some reason, the industry, maybe because there was no immediate need for military work, he was doing experiments on making planes faster and usable for attack. So did that turn into Brigade d'Assaut? Yes. Much later? Okay, okay. And so apparently he himself just gave up the company But it stayed in Toulouse, which is amazing. So apparently then what happened was we have the wonderful, wonderful period of the 1930s when Latacoer had finally figured out first the going Toulouse to Barcelona and over the Pyrenees. And he created this wonderful mythical thing called Aeropostale. Yeah, Aeropostale, yeah. Aeropostale is part of this mythical period of time when we have very famous, very crazy young men who are willing to risk their lives, and certainly a lot of them did lose their lives, to see if you could fly faster and farther. And of course, among these pilots were Saint-Exupéry. Right. The author of Le Petit Prince, The Little Prince. The author of The Little Prince. So Aeropostale, because Latacoer said, okay, commercial aviation, maybe people aren't yet ready to get into a thing that flies, but we can send mail. We can send mail and we can cut down. How do you get mail from Europe, for instance, to South America? It takes weeks on a boat. So the very first trips that they took on these planes, they took mail. And that's why it became known as Aeropostale. And they went from France down to the west coast of Africa. Right, because Aeropostale literally means air mail. And Senegal, I guess, is where they stopped first in Western Africa. And from there, because it's closer, they flew across to South America and then eventually across the Andes from Brazil to Chile. Which was not easy. Across the Andes in those tiny little planes. Now, they didn't have anything. They didn't have the instruments. They didn't have radar. No GPS, no radar, no nothing. They didn't have uh, pressurized cabins. How did they survive? Well, you had to have strong body. Yeah, body. You have to have something else too. Yeah, you know, really. And among the people, the two of the most famous are Saint Exupéry and a man named Jean Mermoz, who unfortunately both died in World War II at different times during World War II. Right. And Saint Exupéry, anyway, was a kind of a mysterious death. So we've been talking about him ever since. But that's not the topic of today's conversation. Yeah. He disappeared in the ocean. Mermoz disappeared somewhere over the Andes in 1940. Whether it was connected specifically to what was going on in the war or not, we will never know. But they created the myth that has stayed with us for so long about these brave, crazy, crazy pilots who dared do the stuff that it's the equivalent of the first astronauts going to the moon, basically. Right. Exactly. That. Yeah, yeah. And you know, we still haven't had that for underwater 
we've had a lot of pioneers that do really daring things, but we haven't had the craze for underwater exploration the way we've had it for space and for airplanes. But it'll come eventually. But I guess for some reason, humans... Maybe because it's easier to watch birds than to sit and try and figure out how the fish work under the water. I mean, really, you know, it's like we look at the birds all the time. You can watch them spread their wings and stay in the air. There's a certain fascination with all of that. Definitely, yeah. Birds are amazing. So anyway, Aeropostale was the great mythical period between the two great wars. And for anybody who's interested, if you really want to see a very almost kitschy but really fun, old, old American movie. It was made in 1939. There's an American movie made by the director Howard Hawks. And the movie is called Only Angels Have Wings. And it's really uh, a somewhat romantic take on Arrow Postel. And it is really great to watch. Wait, wait, wait. So romantic, you mean there's a love story in this? There's a love story. But it's really about these crazy guys, you know, and their daring do about risking their lives to go fly across the mountains in South America, which are seven, 8,000 meters high. It gives you an idea, in spite of the romance in the story and all of that, of really how pioneers they were. Yeah. Oh, and there were some women also who did crazy stuff like that. Are you going to get to them? Yes. In fact, what I discovered was that there were three or four women before even Amelia Earhart, who disappeared, I guess, also in the 19... 19- 40s or maybe 1939. I don't remember what year she disappeared. I don't know that. But there were three women in France who were among the very first pilots to fly during World War I, believe it or not. And the very first woman to have a pilot license was in 1909. Wow. Which really means she was flying one of these cloth and balsa wood kind of things up in the air. Her name was Emily uh, Pelletier. And she also disappeared in a crash. These were all what the French like to call casse-cou. Huh? Wait, say casse-cou. Casse-cou. Uh, yeah, yeah, really, yeah. daredevil. Uh, yeah. Uh, really. You didn't talk about Louis Blériot. No, I didn't. No. You want to talk about him? Well, I know this song about him. I don't know that song. Vive Louis Blériot. Il a traversé la France. La, la, la. Oh, it's a terrible song. It's this horrible, kitschy song. It's, but it sounds very much yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. You were talking about, about a kitschy movie. Right, so, really. Huh, the French kids, we learned our songs Have about you learned aviators. That in school? Yeah. I don't know if I learned it in school or if it was a thing that kids say. Ah, I don't know, but I just know this song about Louis Blériot. Okay. And he went across, I think, the channel first and then cross France. That's true. He was the first one to cross the channel. And the English were probably saying... Mm, we should have been doing this before you or something like that. You know, Maybe maybe they did and we just don't know. Well, nobody wants to admit it anyway. <laughs> the, the French-English <laughs> thing goes way back, you know. Yeah, really that's is. true. Yeah. So basically, why is all of the aviation industry still here in Toulouse? Well, it could have disappeared, to be honest. In the 1930s with the Great Crash, it affected the world, basically. France went into an economic depression. There were lots of political issues, social issues. And the burgeoning new industry of aviation really pretty much came to a halt by the end of the 1930s because of economic problems, because of economic difficulties. And also world wars. We have 1939 and 1940. And what happens is, of course, with the invasion by the Germans, what does happen is that the Germans, besides having already advanced their aviation industry back home, they take over pretty much all of the factories, and they use all of the natural primary resources in France for their own purposes, to make planes for them, for their military to fight. And they forced, do a lot of forced labor. So it was a very black period in not only the history of France, but it certainly was in the history of French aviation and its industry. And it doesn't really come back until after, right after World War II, starting in 1947, 1948, there's a huge, enormous investment. And I don't know if it was just France or it was actually NATO. My guess is that there was also a certain involvement of the allies in this to rebuild the French aviation industry. And it was still in Toulouse. They had no interest in moving it anywhere else. Well, they had the know-how. They had the people who had tested. You know, a lot of this is 
trial and error at the beginning anyway. To have the good ideas, you have to first have the bad ideas a lot of the time. And so you just have to try things. If you don't ever try anything, you don't advance. Interestingly enough, they probably, you know, the hangars were still in the Toulouse area. Of course, the airport in Blagnac, which is just on the western edge of Toulouse itself. A lot of the exterior structures were still there. And of course, they could get back their materials. The investment was such that they also encouraged a lot of students to become engineers because they had stopped basically during World War II. And so with all of that, by 1955, that is when the Caravel was invented, the wonderful, beautiful Caravel, which is really an important plane. And it was designed to be made in great numbers. So this now we're talking about scale. The scale of the operations is now getting much bigger. And that's really what propelled the aviation industry in Toulouse as we know it today. Absolutely. And of course, I guess, all things considered, it's by the end of the 50s that people are really starting to use planes to travel, you know, much, much more than before. So by 1969, which seems like yesterday, but of course is now what? It's 50 something years ago, really. There is a huge factory that's called Sud Aviation, and it was the largest in Europe, and it employed over 24,000 people. And they created the Caravelle, and then they created the Concorde. And then by 1970, all of that was turned into what we now know as Airbus, which is the conglomerate. And the reason why they decided to create that was to be in competition with Boeing and Douglas, which of course were both and still are American companies. So the conglomerate was formed in 1970. And with all of that, everything in terms of the finishing of the planes, the conception of the planes, and the delivery of the planes stays here in Toulouse. And we have Airbus, which not only became the major producer of airplanes for commercial purposes, but also for military purposes. Right. Now it's getting to be a bigger deal since the events with Russia invading Ukraine. And, you know, it's interesting because since they deliver so many planes in Toulouse, it's a big deal when they deliver a plane to a customer and they do this almost daily. And what happens is they take the customers on an inaugural flight on this new plane. And all of these inaugural flights fly between Toulouse and Albi, which means they fly over my house. And so I see when I'm out with the dog, whatever, and I see a plane, it's not like I live over the airport. I don't see planes all the time. But when I see a plane, I know it's a delivery uh, or it's a test. And very often you can tell the test because they just, the engines make terrible noises. <laughs> You're like, is this thing going to fall down? Or, but no, they just try things. I actually was out the day they did the inaugural flight of the 380. I actually saw it. It really, I have to say, I mean, there's something amazing to me and absolutely impressive about these things. And of course, the 380 it was, I mean, yes, it still flies, but since they're not making it anymore, they had such hopes for it. It's a huge, enormous, enormous four engine, massive plane. The wing spread is enormous, you know, and when you see it in the sky, there is nothing, absolutely nothing that looks like that, you know. So they're trying to turn the 380 into a hydrogen plane. That's the idea. They are far, far, far. <laughs> they are very far. They're very far, far. But that's the idea. And it would be very cool if it worked. It certainly would. But they got to try it with a big plane. They got something big. If it's hydrogen, it's got to be huge. It's got to be huge yeah. to hold all of that. So, of course, now what we have is that thanks to the beginning, the birth of aviation in Toulouse from the 1960s on, not only is the aviation industry in Toulouse, but you have all of the research for space. So you have the research and the places where they make the satellites, where they do all of the research for space travel. Toulouse is the center for everything. It's space, with aviation, with going up in the sky and going further than that. Right. They train a lot of pilots in Toulouse. They train a lot of engineers. We have a lot of that sort of business around here and schools. And so people who are in that trade, of course, know of it. It's a major industry in the world, but it's an industry that's needing to change. And I think in France, Airbus has totally got the message. We need to make our planes less polluting. Yes, yes. 
and this is something that they really want to do. Now, it'll take some time to get there. You know, when it comes to polluting less, there's a lot of easy things you can do. If you electrify stuff, then all of a sudden, well, electricity can be made cleanly. Even if it's not made cleanly right now, you can turn towards clean electricity. But an electric plane is not for a big one. Not for a big one. Not enough energy. They are really working this problem and trying to, and that's one of the reasons why the A380 became not as desirable is because they had reached the point where they just couldn't make it more efficient. They couldn't make it more efficient. And by virtue of its size, they had to fill it up with so many people. It was very hard to do. I must say it was really comfortable. I mean, now they have just officially retired the 747. They still fly. But just a few weeks ago, there was a huge article about how that's it. It's gone. It's in retirement. In terms of production, There's that's it. This is something that's important. But when there are problems with airplanes, no matter what, if it's a, an Airbus or a Boeing plane, people here are palpably sad about it. Nobody here gets giddy because Boeing is running into some production problem. That's not how it works. You know, these are people who want the airplanes to fly and do great. We don't want incidents. We don't want problems. The mentality here is very much like, let's make this industry better rather than, you know, let's like, oh, your plane is dumb. We don't No, That's childish. There's none of that. No. Uh, Talking to my students, which is very interesting because it's always interesting. I kind of like play all of this off of them, bounce off these ideas. And, you know, you're absolutely right. Airbus is very much oriented towards new things in experimentation. And it's really fascinating. The number of engineers, the number of people who go to the schools here are enormous. It's a very big, widespread kind of thing. The whole campus is really fascinating to visit. And all I could think of is, wouldn't it be fun to bring back saint exupéry Mermoz and some of these other pilots from the beginning of the 20th century and have them fly one of these kinds of things? I don't you think know? they'd know what to do with it. Do you realize we're talking about an industry that actually was born only about 120 years ago? And look at how big it's gotten and where we've gone so far. It's changed the world, really. It was a major... Anyway, the world is always changing. All right. Put your wings on, Annie. Here we go. I'm not an engineer, but I do know that wings don't work for me. <laughs> Merci, Elise. You're welcome, Annie. Au revoir. Au revoir. The Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written, hosted, and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2023 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons Attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.